Hi everyone, um, so you asked me to go through uh, paper 4 with you from uh, November 17, so that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm probably only going to have time to go through stuff from my half of the course. Um, if you do have stuff from Mr. Rowland's side, um, then please go ahead and ask him, I'm sure he'll be delighted to uh, answer all your questions. So let's, get kick, let's kick off then. Um, what may be deduced from the difference in temperature? Um, between two objects. Now, that's quite an odd sounding question um, until you think about well, there's actually only one thing that can be told or we can find out from the, the just difference um, between two things, um, and that is uh, the direction of heat transfer. Um, so, obviously, as you know, um, it will always be. Uh, from hotter to colder. Um, so that's kind of what they mean by that. Uh, and then they say, uh, state the basic principle by which temperature um, is measured. And again, um, quite a, a subtly worded question there. They're not saying what is temperature, they're saying what's the principle that we use to measure it. Um, and again, that's quite, that's quite mean. Because what I think I would probably think about initially is, is saying something to do with average kinetic energy of the particles or something like that. Um, but it's saying the principle by which it's measured. Um, so the, the idea is there, the way that you measure temperature um, is that you use a property of the substance that changes with temperature. Now again, I think that that's um, a little bit subtle, um, but if you think about it a little bit more, it kind of it kind of does make sense. But you've sort of got to speak examiner um, in that in that instance. Um, so then it says, by reference your answer in A part two, explain why two thermometers may not give the same temperature reading for an object. And again, this is a really, really subtle point, and, and one that kind of goes to the heart of what physics really is. So at first it seems really mean, but if you think about it a little bit more, it's actually kind of cool. Um, it's kind of interesting that CIE have put it in there, and, and I could be, I could, you could go on the route of thinking they're really evil and they hate me for it, but actually I quite like this question, um, because you have to get in this idea that thermometers are usually... Um, calibrated for set fixed points. That's the first thing. That's how we actually create a thermometer. So classic one is we say get some water that's in the process of melting, so it's transferring from uh, liquid to gas, so, it's, so we know it's at zero degrees centigrade. And then you say that's zero, boom, well, whatever that property is, be it how far some um, some liquids moved up a tube, or the pressure of a gas, whatever. You say that's zero, and then you say, okay, we'll now get some water that's boiling, that's 100. And we just say, well, we'll split it up. So, because you've calibrated them for set points, um, they may not be linear, uh, or the property may not vary linearly between these points. Um, so, if that is the case, then what you find is that your thermometer, even if you've perfectly accurately calibrated it, the thermometer may still give a wrong reading. Now, I know what you're thinking, that seems unfair, but actually it's quite important because that is how a real thermometer works. Um, a real thermometer does rely on us calibrating it accurately and assuming linearity between these points, and you don't always get that. So, yeah, it's 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 a mean one, but it's it's quite a good one. Uh, quite part C, aluminium block of mass 600 grams. I'm going to just highlight that mass 600 grams is heated at a constant rate of 95 watts for six minutes. What's the heat capacity? Initial temperature is 24. Assume that no thermal energy is lost to surroundings. Show that the final temperature is 80 degrees. Well, this is a nice gift to give you after those horrible questions. This one's, um, this one's quite a kind thing to put in. Um, so, first thing we're going to want is the total energy transferred. So energy transferred is power times time. And then we're going to use the fact that the energy transferred to something is equal to mc 
delta temperature or change in temperature. So I can say that power times time is equal to uh, mass times C times delta T. And if I substitute in my numbers, uh, my power is 95 watts. My time is six minutes, which of course I need to convert into seconds. So I need to multiply by 60. And that will be equal to my mass, which is 0 0.67. Again, remember there's a little bit of a gotcha in there because they give me uh, mass in grams. Uh, times SHC, which is 910. And thankfully, they give me it in joules per kilogram per Kelvin, so I don't need to worry about that too much. Uh, times by delta T. Rearrange that, um, and I will get delta T, or you might see it as theta, uh, that will be 56 degrees centigrade. So I've gone from 20 degrees, so 24, which is my start, plus my temperature change of 56 is 80 degrees C. Easy. Okay, so now we're thinking about the real world. So it says obviously there are going to be uh, any velocities surroundings. So the actual variation of, with time t of the temperature theta of the block is shown in figure 1.1. Use the information in part 1 to draw on figure 1.1 a line to represent the temperature of the block, assuming no heat loss to the surrounding. So, um, what we expected was for it to go from uh, 24 degrees to 80 degrees at 6 minutes. Um, so I'm going to put a plot point here. Now you're going to have to excuse me trying to draw on this laptop screen. Um, it's not the most accurate thing in the world. Um, so I'd see that. I would still start from 24. But then I'd have a, not like that, come on, that's rubbish even by my standards. Um, I'd expect a straight line coming out something like, what? I've, I've, chosen, a, I've chosen a line, I've chosen that, come on, explain everything. Do what you, okay, explain everything doesn't want to work today. Um, but I see a straight line, you draw a straight line from there. Um, and it says calculate the total energy loss. Now, don't be tempted to go doing some weird, like, oh, I've got to try and find this area or something. No, 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 it's much simpler than that. Um, we can just say, well, what is the energy that's actually being transferred? And then what should, uh, oh, what, what, yeah, what's the actual energy that I've transferred? The actual energy I've transferred is the power times time because it's electrical energy. So I can say uh, E transferred. is power times time, which is, uh, we've got to 95 times 6 times 60. And then I can say, well, what's the difference in energy um, between the energy that's gone into here? Because I've got this point up here. That's the energy that's gone into the block. So I can say that uh, energy in the block will be mc theta, which is uh, uh, right, uh, nine, wait, no, hang on, integer is temperature, yep, sorry, uh, 0 0.670, which is the mass, times the heat capacity, which is 910, times the temperature change, which is 64, because that's what we would see over here, this is at 64, uh, take away 24, um, that comes out to 244, yeah, come on, 24400 zero, zero joules. So the loss will be uh, this energy transferred, um, which I'm not going to bother working out because I can't be bothered because I'm a lazy toad. Um, but it'll be that. Take away uh, that 24400, zero, zero, which comes in at 9,800 joules. So here we are, the nice old uh, SHM question. So, starting off with a definition. Uh, state by reference simple harmonic motion, what is meant by angular frequency? Um, so angular frequency, um, this is another one that's in your list of definitions um, that you just have to know. Uh, angular frequency is 2 pi multiplied by frequency. Um, that's just the definition. 
Then we've got a uh, thin metal strip is clamped at one end so that it is horizontal. A load of mass M is attached to its free end. This causes displacement S in the rod in the strip. That's shown in figure 2.1. Uh, the load is displaced vertically and then released. The load oscillates. Variation in acceleration with displacement is shown in the figure. Now, really important. This should not be a curve, sinusoidal curve, because this is showing how acceleration varies with displacement. So you're expecting it to be a straight line. That's what tells you it's SHM, because it's directly proportional to displacement. Um, so determine the displacement of the load before it is made to oscillate. So the displacement um, will be, it's initially going down. Um, and we're measuring S as its position uh, from zero, so it's been you know, load is displaced vertically and then released. Um, so when acceleration is zero, that will be its um, equilibrium point. And then we're saying how far is it displaced downwards like that? Um, Oh, sorry, it's below before it's made to oscillate. Before it's made to oscillate. Sorry. So, as yeah, before it's made to oscillate, that will be the, the equilibrium point. Um, so, that will be 2.0 centimeters. And then find the amplitude of the oscillations of the load. Well, the amplitude will be this distance here. It will be the difference between the maximum displacement and the equilibrium displacement. Um, so, that will be 1.0. Five centimeters. Show that the load is undergoing a simple harmonic motion. Um, so we can say that uh, the uh, displacement displacement from zero or equilibrium. is directly proportional to, uh, it's not, sorry, uh, we can say displacement from zero is proportional with a straight line to acceleration and we can say that the negative gradient shows that uh, acceleration is in the opposite direction. Direction to displacement. Because remember, the standard definition of simple harmonic motion is when the acceleration is directly proportional to displacement. Uh, then you're asked <coughs> excuse me, to calculate uh, the frequency of the oscillation of the load. Um, so to do that, um, there is a couple of different ways that you can do this. Probably the simplest thing to do is to remember from all the equations that you've learned that acceleration is equal to negative omega squared x. And then we can take some points on our graph. So we can say that negative omega squared is equal to a over x. Now this is a, this is x in this case, so I can say that omega squared is equal to the negative of 1 over the gradient. So I just need to find the gradient. Um, so for example, um, I could say that, um, well just, take, just basically take any two points um, on there and that will give me an omega squared. If you find two different points, find the gradient. Um, that will give you an omega squared of 60 uh, radians per second. And then we're going to use the fact that frequency, sorry, um, 
angular frequency is equal to 2 pi f. So f is equal to omega over 2 pi. So I'll get 60 divided by 2 pi, uh, which is, sorry, omega squared. Ooh. Omega squared is that. So omega, sorry, is the square root of that. Um, so I should get square root of 60 over 2 pi, um, which comes out as 1.2 pounds. Well now, this question looks familiar, doesn't it? Um, as you can see, it's another one of those ones that they like to throw in again and again and again. So do spend some time um, going through the past paper questions because you'll spot these questions coming up over and over again. So two functions of your copper braid, um, they are to act as a return for the signal or um, to complete the circuit. Um, and it is also um, to shield from either for shield from crosstalk. For or, 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 or interference. Again, one of the definitions that you just kind of need to know. Uh, so just two reasons why a wire pair is not usually used to connect a aerial to receiver. So remember that you just basically remember the, uh, the properties of uh, wire pairs. Wire pairs they have um, low bandwidth in a copper pair um, and TV is typically a quite a high a high bandwidth application. Um, the other main reason um, is they're susceptible to crosstalk. Um, you could also say that they have a larger attenuation, um, and you can, yeah, that's probably all you're reasonably going to talk about um, based off of what we have learned so far. Uh, the coaxial cable connected to the aerial to the receiver has a length of 14 meters. The cable has an attenuation per unit length of 190 decibels per kilometer. Calculate the fractional loss, the fractional loss in signal power along the transmission. So the first thing we need to find is the total attenuation. To do that, we're going to do a loss per meter, sorry, per kilometer times the actual length. Um, so that would be 190 decibels per kilometer. We have 14 meters, so it'd be 190 times 0 0.014. Um, that will give me 2.66 decibels. Um, and then we're going to find the ratio. So we want to find the ratio, so we're going to use the fact that the signal attenuation is equal to 10 times natural logarithm or, sorry, not the natural logarithm, time, just the logarithm of P2 over P1. Now, this is a good point, stop and think. Fractional loss. Um, I should therefore be expecting a number less than zero, because I'm, think, I'm trying to find a fraction that has been lost from my signal. Um, if I get something bigger than that, then I'm saying that my signal is magically getting larger, and that can't, that doesn't make sense. Um, so, uh, P2 in this case will be my power out, P1 will be my power in, because that's how I'm going to get loss of signal. So I can say that 2.66 is equal to 10 log of P out over P in. So I'm going to uh, divide by 10, so I'll say 0 0.26 is equal to uh, log of P out over P in, um, and then I need to undo the logs, so I'm going to say uh, 10 to the power of 0 0.26 is equal to P out over P in, uh, 10 which is equal to 0 0.54. Um, so that's the ratio of power out over power in. 
Um, but the fractional loss, so power out of power in will give me the actual output power. I want to find the loss from that. So the loss will be 1 take away 0 0.54, which is 0 0.46. So just be careful there with the language that they use. If they're asking for a fractional loss, and we need to be really careful about what this is showing you. This is giving me the ratio of power out to power in. Um, so it's a fraction transmitted, not a fraction loss. Just be really careful when you know what the equations are saying. That's very easy to trick you up. It's time for everybody's all-time favourite, which is the op-amp questions. I know I can feel your excitement and joy at getting this question from here. Um, so, let's start off then. What is this thing, a virtual Earth? So you've got to just learn this, guys, okay? It's just, it's just you've got to learn it. So, all comes down to the fact that the gain of the op-amp is very large. Okay. V plus is at Earth, or zero volts. Um, we assume that the op amp doesn't saturate. Remember, saturate means that it tries to give an output that is greater than its uh, input voltage, sorry, than its uh, power supply voltage. Um, which means it stops working properly. If it is to not saturate, then uh, V plus must be equal to V minus. Okay. Now, I get it. <laughs> that, that seems kind of backwards. Um, we're saying that because it doesn't saturate, it mustn't saturate, and it seems crazy. But it, it, it works. That's the logic. Um, and those are the four points that they always expect to you to say. Now you could say it some other ways. You could say that if there is a difference between those two, then the feedback will act until, the inverting feedback will act to change the output until they are at zero again. But that's quite difficult to do. Um, so we generally just kind of go with this, this chain of logic here instead. Then derive an expression in terms of resistance R1 and R2 for the gain of the amplifier in the circuit. Ooh, okay. So, um, here are the steps that you need to say. And you need to start off by saying, um, and making it very clear, R, v, R at the V in the... Blah, blah, blah. Resistance of the inverting input is approximately infinite. So we're saying that no current can flow into the op-amp. If no current can flow through the op-amp, then all of the current has to follow the path I've just drawn. So that means that R1, so current in R1 is equal to current in R2. If that is the case, then I can say that, uh, what can I say next? Uh, oh yeah, sorry, okay. Um, so what's the potential drop? The potential drop across here must be V in, because this is at zero volts. We've just helpfully just reminded us of the fact that P is a virtual Earth. So this, the voltage across R1 must be V in. The voltage across R2 must be uh, V out. So I can say that V in take away zero, that's the voltage drop. Um, divided by R, that's so V, that will give me the current in R1. The current in R1 must be equal to the current in R2. How do I find the current in R2? Well, that's voltage divided by uh, 
resistance again. Uh, the voltage will be zero take away V out, and that will be divided by R2. Um, so I rearrange that, and I get uh, V out over V in is equal to negative R2 over R1, and V out over V in is equal to the gain. Woohoo! Um, tough, tough question. Um, you should just learn this. You've got to go in there. So uh, the circuit in figure uh, 7.1, the ratio of R2 over R1, or the gain, is 4.5. The variation with time t of the total, sorry, of the input V in is shown there. On figure 7.2, show the variation time t of the output. Um, so it starts at, so the input starts at zero, goes up to what looks like three volts to me. Um, so the maximum output, um, will be uh, 3 volts multiplied by 4.5 and that tells me it's going to saturate um, before we get to that point. So um, what are we going to do next? So I can tell it's going to go to negative 9 volts. Why will it go to negative 9 volts? because there's minus sign here, so it should be inverted, whatever happens. Um, so when will it reach 9 volts? Let's do, okay, yeah, 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 so let's do 9 volts divided by 4.5. That tells me um, what input voltage will saturate it, so it will saturate at 2 volts. So what I'm going to say is that when the input voltage is 2 volts here, I'm going to be expecting this to be minus 9, so somewhere over here. I'm doing this very roughly, you will do it a lot more neatly than me. So I'd expect that again, could it be negative because it's uh, inverting? And then I'd expect it uh, to remain at 9 volts until it reaches this point where again the input goes below 2 and then it will come linearly back down again. So that's the uh, quick and dirty way of working out that. Well, surprise, surprise, it's another Outline the Principles of CT question. So hopefully this is now second nature to you. Um, we, how do we take a CT scan? Um, firstly, we take a single, we try and take a single, if Mr. Wright can spell, a uh, single X-ray of a slice. Um, we then repeat the slices at different angles. Um, we build these up and process with computers uh, to build uh, a 2D image of a slice. Um, you then repeat for multiple slices um, and you then combine the slices to build a 3D image. Hopefully you've just got that off pat by now and you know it uh, through and through. And then it's everybody's favourite. It's time for the voxel cues. Um, so uh, here are the voxels. Here's V1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, the section is viewed in four different directions. V1 to V4, as for figure 9.1. Detector reading for each section then stored and summed. So they've done most of the hard work for us. The background count is 26. Um, find the, determine the pixel numbers for each one. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is subtract 26 from each value. Oh, this is where you're going to be embarrassed at my terrible mental maths. So that will give me 21. 
this will be 33, yeah, this will be 18, that sounds right, because that's divisible by 3, <laughs> um, and this should be 28, does that sound reasonable, it doesn't sound like something's gone wrong, I messed up somewhere, uh, Oh, sorry, 26. 26. For oh, shame. Um, and then what we need to do is divide each one by 3, because we've taken 1, 2, 3, 4 images, so we always do n minus 1 for the diversion. There's no rhyme or reason to this, remember. You don't try and understand why it works, because it only works on a 4x4 four four box or cube. Um, if you tried to do it on a 3x3, three three, this wouldn't work anyway. Um, but when we divide that, 21 divided by 3 is 7. Uh, 33 divided by 3 is 11, 18 divided by 3 is, I hope, 6, uh, and that shouldn't be 26, should it? Sorry, that should just be 6, uh, because 6 divided by 3 is 2, and that's it. That's what our patient apparently looks like.